Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. Hi. In the first of the two GI tract lectures, we'll discuss some general features of the GI tract organization and look at the characteristic histology of the esophagus and the stomach. Anatomically speaking, the gastrointestinal tract or the GI tract is a really, really long muscular tube that runs throughout our body. And this tube has some dilations like the stomach that's specialized for temporary food storage. There are this really, really long and tortuous area called the small intestine where a lot of food absorptions takes place. So there are many, many regions within this long muscular tube that is specialized for different functions. And everything that runs throughout this long GI tract is considered to be in the external environment. And that's because both the entry and exit of this long GI tract is open and continuous with the external environment. So think of a really long and tortuous tunnel that runs throughout our body. And that's our GI tract. It's just that unlike a regular tunnel, for example, where a car can go through and as the car goes in and out of this tunnel, their shape really doesn't change much. But as soon as something goes in through our GI tract tunnel, it comes out the other end completely destroyed and in their most broken down form because as it travels through the GI tract, our body has done some damage in order to suck out all the goodies into our tissues and only eliminating things that we don't need anymore. So you can consider the GI tract as a deadly tunnel in a way. All right, enough of that. The GI tract has portions that are pretty well affixed to the body versus portions that are fairly movable. So for example, things like our oral cavity and the anus are fairly well fixed to the body wall. So entryway and exit, their positions don't change much. Whereas things like the stomach and the small and portion of the large intestine are actually quite movable within our abdominal cavity. Though they're all still anchored somehow to the back body wall by a sheet of mesenteries or connective tissues. And in a way, their ability to move kind of aids their function of mixing the food as well as moving things along a bit. In addition to their internal and innate mechanism of being being able to contract and move things along. Along the GI tract, there are also some really, really important accessory structures such as the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, as well as pancreas that provide some critical functional elements such as producing the saliva which not only lubricates the food bolus that's going through the initial portion of the GI tract but also secreting the amylase which can start to break down the carbohydrate materials. The liver produces bile that can emulsify fat and the pancreas produces a lot of digestive enzymes that can break down the big carbohydrates, fats, as well as protein so that the cells of the small intestine can actually absorb some of these macromolecules. So while they're called the accessory structures, I might even call these organs critical structures. In terms of the GI tract histology, throughout this long muscular tube, we'll quickly learn that there are some general features that are shared throughout the length of the GI tract, and that is the composition of the GI tract wall. It is comprised of four histologically distinct layers. Going from inside to outside, we have the mucosa. Mucosa is kind of like a skin inside the body in that it protects our tissues from any kind of external environment, which which the lumen of the GI tract is. So mucosa is found in things like the respiratory tract as well as the urogenital tract and now in the GI tract wall as well. 
Outside of the mucosa, there is a layer of connective tissue called the submucosa. And outside of that, we have the muscularis propria or externa. And this layer is comprised of at least two distinct layers of muscles that are oriented in perpendicular plane to each other. We'll look at this in a little bit here. And the external most layer of the GI tract is comprised of either the adventitia or serosa. Adventitia is essentially a connective tissue that holds the portion of the GI tract to the rest of the surrounding tissues or organs. We'll find adventitia in the areas of the GI tract that are fairly fixed to the body or other surrounding organs. And adventitia is typically dense connective tissue in terms of its composition, as opposed to the serosa being those visceral layer of the peritoneum. So we'll find the serosa covering the outermost aspect of the GI tract in the portions that are actually movable and positioned within the peritoneum or the abdominal cavity. More on this in a little bit as well. And while it's pretty convenient to know that there are reliable four-layered organization of the GI tract wall throughout this long tube, it is also important to remember there are some structural and histological compositional variations depending on the different functions and locations of these GI tract portions. So we'll spend a significant amount of time looking at these specific features of various regions in later sections. But for now, we'll look at the general features of the GI tract histology in a little more detail. We'll start with the mucosa. The mucosa is the innermost lining of the GI tract wall that is in contact with the lumen. So here's the lumen. This is a cross section through the esophagus right there. So the mucosa, as with any other respiratory tract or urogenital tract wall, is comprised of the lining epithelium that is in contact with the lumen. And in case of the esophagus, we are lined by the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, which makes sense since we are swallowing a lot of bolus of food and drinks of different chemical nature as well as temperature. We need a lot of protection in this wet environment. Underneath the lining epithelium, there's usually a loose connective tissue that supports the lining epithelium, and this layer is called the lamina propria. And in addition to being comprised of the loose connective tissue, lamina propria is also a common area that can support or host lots of exocrine glands, as well as the malts, mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues. Now, in case of the GI tract, the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues can also also be called the G-A-L-T or the GALTS and with the G standing for the gut associated lymphoid tissue or the G-I associated lymphoid tissues. And remember we had this relationship in the respiratory tract with the malts associated with bronchi or bronchioles being typically called the BALTS. And lastly, the mucosa in the GI tract wall has one more important component, and that is the muscularis mucosa. This is this thinner muscular layer that is typically comprised of smooth muscles, and the contraction of the muscularis mucosa allows somewhat of an independent movement of the mucosa from the rest of the thick GI tract wall. So this three-layered composition of the mucosa in the GI tract is a fairly unique feature right here. So again, here is the entirety of the mucosa, which is comprised of the innermost epithelium, lamina propria, and then the muscularis mucosa. The submucosa of the GI tract wall is typically comprised of dense irregular connective tissue. It's a little more of a substantial layer, although we may see a little more fatty infiltrates or even some loose connective tissue infiltrates in the submucosa depending on what region of the GI tract we're looking at. 
At any rate, the submucosa contains or hosts some of these submucosal ganglia or the Meissner ganglia, which are collections of neuron cell bodies that perform autonomic functions. So some neural features and their ganglia may be found here, as well as some exocrine glands. And we have an asterisk here because the submucosa for the length of the GI tract typically do not host glands. And the submucosal glands are only kind of limited to the esophagus as well as the duodenum. So these two regions are special in that they have a little more extensive glands that are found within the submucosa. Other than that, the rest of the GI tract will not have the submucosal glands. So something to be mindful of. And likewise, the malts can also be found in the submucosa, but only in some specialized regions. These type of malts or the galls that are found in the submucosa tend to be fairly large, so that they actually start in the lamina propria of the mucosa, and then they end up extending into the submucosa. So these type of large malts are typically associated with the latter parts of the GI tract. Tract, such as the ilium, which is the distal most portion or kind of last portion of the small intestine, as well as some isolated areas of the colon, but more prominently in the appendix. So again, the malt in the submucosa, kind of limited to the ilium, appendix, and kind of isolated regions of the colon. But for the most part, throughout the length of the rest of the GI tract, we may not see such large malts in the submucosa. The third layer out is the muscularis propria or externa. And as the name suggests, this is a more substantial layer comprised of muscle tissues. And throughout the majority of the GI tract, the muscularis propria is comprised of two layers, which we can see from the macroscopic view here. The inner layer is typically arranged in circular conformation, as we can see. So the inner layer is called the inner circular layer. And the second or external layer is typically arranged in a longitudinal orientation to the long axis. So that's called the outer longitudinal layer. But squish in between the two layers, we typically have yet another neural plexus or ganglia called the myenteric or a rubox plexus. And again, these are the autonomic neural structures that allow the peristaltic movement of the GI tract wall. And again, the outer layer of the muscularis externa is the outer longitudinal layer. And lastly, we have the adventitia or serosa or sometimes both. Adventitia is found in regions of the GI tract that is a little more fixed to the rest of the body, whereas the serosa is found covering more of a movable portions of the GI tract, such as the stomach, the small intestine, and portion of the large intestine. Looking at the specific histology of the esophagus, we still recognize some commonalities or general features of the GI tract here. For example, we see the mucosa, which is comprised of the lining epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. The submucosa down here comprised of the dense irregular connective tissue. Then the muscularis propria or the externa, which is comprised of two layers of muscle tissues, the inner circular layer and outer longitudinal layer. Sandwiched in between, we would expect to see some neural structures. And then outside, we have for the most part, the adventitia that is running through the mediastinum in the thorax. But down here at the distal most part, which has entered the abdominal cavity, now this is a movable portion of the GI tract or the esophagus. So we may be able to see some sorosal covering of this very short segment of the esophagus. With that, let's look at the mucosa in a little more detail. At the macroscopic scale, we can see that the mucosa is actually thrown into these folds, which we call the mucosal infoldings. And this is typical of a muscular tube that doesn't have a really rigid structural support that can keep this lumen open, like the cartilage like the trachea in the neighboring region. So in the absence of something like the hyaline cartilage that can hold the lumen open, the esophageal lumen is usually in a collapsed form and its mucosa happens to be kind of folded in this manner. 
but as the food bolus passes through this lumen, the mucosa can allow a temporary expansion of the lumen before it collapses back in again. At any rate, the lining epithelium is typically comprised of the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, again because a lot of food bolus that passes through, so we need a mechanism or an epithelium that can withstand a lot of friction, force, and different temperatures as well as the chemical nature of the food bolus. At higher magnification, we can appreciate the basement membrane here, sometimes undulating, which is good in order to create increased surface area for hemidesmosomes to form between the basal layer of that non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and the underlying connective tissue. The lamina propria is typically comprised of loose connective tissue. And outside of that, we have muscular mucosa layer that is comprised of thin layer of smooth muscle tissue. Submucosa of the esophagus comprised of dense irregular connective tissue. And this is where the esophagus has a unique characteristic and that is the submucosal glands. This is an esophagus from a different tissue that's stained with H and E. And here too, we can appreciate the, the mucosal lining right here, comprised of the epithelium, lamina propria, and in this case, we can appreciate the galt or the malt here, the lymphoid nodule, and the last outermost layer of the mucosa called the muscularis mucosa. So below the muscularis mucosa, we have now the submucosa, comprised of dense irregular connective tissue with some vasculature, of course. But within the submucosa, what we're seeing here is the exocrine gland comprised of mostly mucus secreting tubules. But when we zoom in on that area, we'll see that there are some areas of serous secreting cells forming little demi loons so although most of the secretions here seems to be mucin they may have some minor serous compositions as well and this of course would be the duct here we have a little more duct also the secretory unit seems to be comprised in a bit of a lobular organization so i'm comfortable calling this a compound tubulo exocrine gland in the submucosa the next layer, the muscularis propria or externa of the esophagus is also kind of interesting. We have to remember that the esophagus is a really long tube that runs from the oropharynx all the way down to the stomach in the abdomen. So this long tube is actually loosely divided into three regions, the proximal, middle, and distal thirds. And depending on which area we're looking at, the tissue composition can be varied. Specifically, the proximal most region of the esophagus, the muscularis propria, is comprised of the two layers of skeletal muscles, which makes sense because this area coordinates with our voluntary muscles of the larynx and allows us to complete the swallowing process. The middle layer is where we see a mixture of both skeletal and smooth muscle tissues. So we see the two types of muscles in the middle third of the esophagus comprising the muscularis propria layer. And when we get into the distal third, then both the inner and outer layers of the esophagus will be comprised of only the smooth muscle tissues. So in this histological image, when we look at the boxed area at a higher magnification, what we'll see is, lo and behold, a mixture of skeletal muscle tissues. We know that because of polygonally shaped cell outlines with nuclei that are peripherally positioned. So we see the skeletal muscle fibers that are intermixed with the smooth muscle tissues in the vicinity. And based on this histology, we can conclude that this esophagus was biopsied or sampled from the middle third of the esophagus. And this cross-section, if we were to look at the muscular area at a higher magnification, we can see that the both 
the inner layer and the outer layer of the muscularis externa are comprised of both smooth muscle tissues. So we can then conclude that this section of the esophagus or tissue came from the distal third of the esophagus. When we look at the outermost layer of the esophagus, depending on where this esophagus is traveling through, expect to see the adventitia, which is just loose to dense connective tissue that anchors anchors the esophagus to the surrounding organ or tissue structures, whereas serosa, we're actually expecting to see some loose connective tissue that is wrapped nicely on the outside by the mesothelial lining, the visceral peritoneum, which is comprised of simple squamous epithelium. Distal to the esophagus, we have the stomach. So anatomically, stomach is divided into four specific regions. The cardia is the portion that is closest to the esophagus. The fundus is this dome-shaped region of the stomach. The body is, of course, the largest segment of the stomach. And the pylorus is this cone or funnel-shaped structure that leads out of the stomach macroscopically and at the gross level, there are these internal or mucosal folds called rugae. And stomach, again, being this muscular tube without any rigid structure that can keep this tube open at all times, is typically collapsed when the stomach is empty. And when that happens, the mucosa and its underlying submucosa can be thrown into pretty impressive folds that we can appreciate at macroscopic level. But these rugae are not necessarily permanent structures. So as we eat a large meal, these rugae may flatten out as the stomach expands. Now, based on the locations of these four subregions of the stomach, we may be able to predict already that perhaps the, the histology of these four regions may be a little bit different. Specifically, we have to remember that the function of the stomach is not only to store the food that is coming into the stomach, but also to start to denature a lot of food materials that are coming in, as well as creating a really hostile environment for any potential microbes and pathogens that we may be ingesting. So stomach, we've heard of stomach acid. This is where acidic materials are being produced, which means these entryway as well as the exit way may need to have some structural or histological components that can protect the delicate lining of the stomach as well as the the lining of the nearby regions, such as the esophagus and the downstream small intestinal segments from the hostile acidic stomach content. And what is good at protecting really delicate structures are going to be mucin. So we may be expecting to see some mucin products, whereas the fundus and the body portion of the stomach may be specialized to host a lot of exocrine glands that can produce the hydrochloric acid and some other content. So histologically speaking, the cardia and pylorus of the stomach may have pretty similar histology, much like the fundus and the body may have similar histology that can set them apart from each other. So let's look at the cardia and the pyloric histology first. Here's a histological section through the cardia of the stomach. And here we can see the mucosa, which is comprised of three sublayers is the lining epithelium, the lamina propria, which contains the loose connective tissue with lots of these glandular extensions coming from the covering epithelium, and the muscularis mucosa, this wispy, thin layer of smooth muscles. So that's the mucosa. In terms of the lining epithelium, we're expecting to see a simple columnar epithelium comprised mostly of goblet cells, which makes sense considering the acidic nature of the stomach content. We would want a lot of mucin secreting cells that can protect the stomach lining. And furthermore, all these glands that are in the lamina propria is also comprised of simple branched 
tubular glands that are of mucus secreting type for the same purpose of protecting the stomach lining. And lastly, if we were looking at the lining of the stomach from the luminal perspective, what we'll see are these little openings into the stomach glands from the covering epithelium. So a lot of these kind of pity looking structures are collectively called the gastric pits. And again, these are the entryway into all of these rich gastric glands. So let's look at these elements of the mucosa at a higher magnification, the boxed area, and we can confirm that the lining epithelium here is continuous with the glandular epithelium, which dives into the lamina propria, which should be extending down to the deeper layers of the lamina propria. And we can actually see some of these legging-like branching of the simple branched tubular exocrine glands of these structures. And these glandular epithelium swings back up to become the lining epithelium, then again the glandular epithelium down here. And from this magnification, we can see the pale staining nature of the cells that not only line but also form the glands. So most of these cells are goblet cells. So let's confirm once again by zooming into the lining and glandular epithelial area. And yes, we can now confirm that a lot of these lining epithelial cells are all goblet cells as well as the glandular epithelium down here as well. And looking at this mucosa from the luminal aspect, we can see that there would be a lot of these kind of holes or openings that go into the glands of the stomach. So a lot of these indentations seen from the surface of the stomach lining would be considered the gastric pits. Now deep to the mucosa, we have the submucosa, which is located right here. This layer is found between the muscularis mucosa and the muscularis propria, located right here. For the most part, the submucosa is going to be comprised of dense irregular connective tissue, and within it we might find some autonomic neural plexus called the submucosal ganglia or the Meissner's plexus. The muscular is propria or the external layer located right here. In the stomach, is actually comprised of three layers of smooth muscles. And this muscular is propria or the external layer happens to be slightly more thickened in the cardia and a lot more thickened in the pylorus as this layer forms a partial and proper sphincters that can regulate what goes in and out of the stomach. So again, the thickened muscularis propria is a lot more exaggerated in the pylorus than in the cardia in human stomach. Looking at the boxed area of the muscularis propria or externa of the stomach, we can really confirm the three layers of smooth muscles in the stomach. We have the innermost layer where the smooth muscles are oriented in an oblique way. So this is the innermost oblique layer. Then we have the middle circular layer where the smooth muscles are going around in the stomach. And we have the outermost layer where the smooth muscles are in a longitudinal plane. So when we have a stomach like this, we'll have the innermost layer where the smooth muscles are arranged in oblique fashion. Then we have the circular layer outside of that, which is kind of going around in circles and perpendicular plane to the long axis of the stomach. And then the outermost layer would be going in parallel direction to the long axis of the stomach. So you can imagine how these three layers of muscles can all contract in a wave-like form to churn the stomach while moving things downward. And lastly, we have the outermost layer that is the serosa. And since the stomach is an intraperitoneal organ, or it's a fairly movable organ within the abdominal cavity, we're expecting to see the serosa covering the stomach as opposed to the adventitia. So looking at the boxed area at a higher magnification, what we'll see is the mesothelial lining on the exterior most surface and the underlying connective tissue comprised mostly of loose connective tissue to some amount of dense irregular connective tissue as well, which is sometimes called a subserosal layer.
So that's the cardia and pyloric histology of the stomach. Now looking at the fundus and the body of the stomach, which has quite an unusual and distinctive histology. In this histological image of the fundus and the body of the stomach, you can actually appreciate a lot of these infoldings of the stomach lining. And a lot of these are the rugae, the temporary foldings that can smooth out as the stomach fills. And as for the mucosa, and as for the four-layered organization, we can see the mucosa right here, comprised of the three sub-layers, the lining epithelium, lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. The submucosa forms this core of the rugae and continues down here, and then becomes the core of another rugae right there, so on and so forth. The muscularis externa or propria, and then outside of that we would see the serosa. So looking at the mucosa at a higher magnification in the boxed area, you can really see some interesting histology that is different from the mucosal histology of the pylorus and the cardia of the stomach. The lining epithelium is still comprised of simple columnar epithelium made up mostly of goblet cells yet again. But when we follow this glandular epithelium down into the lamina propria, we'll quickly see that the glands are looking quite different than the mucin-secreting glands of the cardia and the pylorus. And that's because of the specialized cells that form the simple branched tubular exocrine glands of the fundus and body of the stomach. And these are the chief cells, which produce a lot of zymogens, and the parietal cells, which produce the hydrochloric acid. To look at these two types of cells at a higher magnification, let's once again zoom in on the boxed area. And what we see are these eosinophilic staining rounded cells, which are the parietal cells. And these are the cells that are responsible for producing the HCl or the hydrochloric acid. And then we also have these really basophilic staining cells. The reason why these cells stain so basophilic is due to lots of ribosomes and RERs that are in the cytoplasm that are producing these zymogen granules. The zymogen in the chief cells are the pepsinogens. And pepsinogen is a type of proenzyme that once it is released into the stomach lumen and become activated in the acidic environment, thanks to the hydrochloric acid, becomes the pepsin, which is the enzyme that starts to break down the protein molecules. So these two types of cells that comprise the stomach glands in the fundus and body are quite characteristic of the stomach histology in these two regions. The submucosa, as mentioned earlier, is what forms the core of the rugae that's thrown into these large infoldings of the stomach lining, as well as this barrier between the muscularis mucosa and the muscularis propria. Muscularis propria slash externa, of course, is is comprised of the three sub-layers, the oblique, the circular, and longitudinal layers going from internal to outer layer. The serosa can be identified right here. It's a fairly thin one in this particular image. We have a mesodilia lining and underlying subserosa, the loose connective tissue. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below.